Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start by quoting one of Trinity's most illustrious graduates, and certainly its most quotable, Oscar Wilde. In one of his most illustrious and quotable works, The Soul of Man Under Socialism, Wilde wrote, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not even worth glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out, and seeing a better country sets sail. Progress is the realization of utopias. Wild, in case you were wondering, was very much in favor of socialism, though he recognized that it tended to take up too many evenings. I think it's important, though, to start here with maps and utopias, because it is important to recognize that before they are anything else, libraries are fundamentally imaginative spaces. Libraries have been understood quite correctly as models of the universe, as emblems of the harmony of creation, as symbols for infinity, eternity, perfection, God, and yes, utopias. I can't stand in front of you and talk about libraries without making reference to the Argentine writer Borges, the greatest of all imaginers of the library. In his story, The Library of Babel, some of you will remember, he posits an unimaginably vast library containing, and I quote, all that is able to be expressed in every language, all. The detailed history of the future, the autobiographies of the archangels, the faithful catalog of the library, thousands and thousands of false catalogues, the proof of the falsity of those false catalogues, the proof of the falsity of the true catalog, the true history of your death. In his late story, The Book of Sand, he discovers the book of books, and I quote again, the number of pages in this book is literally infinite. No page is the first page and no page is the last. If space is infinite, we are anywhere at any point in space. If time is infinite, we are at any point in time. Libraries occasion these thoughts. When you are in a library, you are entering a metaphysical space, a space where we are, in the words of William Blake, just and true to our own imaginations, those worlds of eternity. So much of the contemporary discourse surrounding universities informing their policy and their funding is understandably utilitarian. Research is often equated solely with funding, rather than with knowledge and discovery, the generation of new ideas. Ideas themselves sometimes seem only of value insofar as they are marketable. Now, I am a faculty dean. My world is one of budgets and staffing, and I am not naive. Libraries, like universities, face the world and are part of that world. But they also resist the world resist the immediate pressures of temporality because they know that new ideas must, by their very definition, run counter to the conventional wisdom. When you are in a library, as Archbishop Usher knew, you are playing the long game. Besides, there is, there must be, a space in which our urge for the numinous can be satisfied. These spaces, for me, are called libraries. To return to Oscar Wilde, it's worth remembering his closing sentence. Progress is the realization of utopias. Without a space for the free play of the imagination, there can be no progress of any kind. The library is the human imagination given literal, physical form. Not to fund a library is an act of barbarism. And before I leave this high rhetorical mode and get, as they say, real, I also want to add that libraries are the very emblems of civilization. Civilization is difficult to quantify, 
but we would know about it if it were not there. In Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Bennet constantly retreats to his library because, for him, the very possession of a library acts as guarantor of his position as a gentleman, which means not only his, of his place within the class system, but that he has a place within a social economy of civilized values. Instead of asking, what does the library of the future look like? we might want to turn the question on its head and ask, what would the future look like without libraries? It would look, in all senses of the word, unimaginable. When the zombie apocalypse comes, <laughs> as reliable sources on the internet tell me it inevitably will, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to barricade myself into the long room and read my way through eternity. That's why libraries are important. And I thought it crucial to say that before I said anything else. So what might the library look like for research in the arts humanities in the light of the digital shift and the social shift underway in libraries? I want to say that I think it looks very bright. I'll start with my own example. I am primarily a textual editor who works on 19th century genre fiction. I am completely wedded to the materiality of the book and to my sense of books as historical objects. I need to know, for example, what a first edition of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds from 1898 looked like, what it feels like, its size and shape, the color and texture of its binding, the thickness and quality of its paper. I need to know what it smells like. I need to know these things because my research makes me a kind of historian of books. But this is not, and this is the point I want to make, this is not a zero-sum game because and no one is suggesting that the increasingly digital nature of the library will mean no more books. Collections will be as valuable as ever, or more so, and researchers without direct access to archives will still do serious research. They can do serious research. I know they can, because this is increasingly the way I do my own research, digitally, online. I've sp spent the past two years editing and annotating the Gothic tales of Arthur Conan Doyle for Oxford University Press. A generation ago, it would have taken me 20 years to do the job half as well. A generation ago, my field of textual editing was very much at the crusty, unfashionable, old-fashioned end of literary studies, very much the preserve of antediluvian Oxbridge farts. That's a technical term from literary criticism. Now, for the very first time, I am at least a little bit sexy, or at least my research is. A whole branch of literary theory, sometimes called surface reading, has in some of its aspects grown up around the digital shift. We are, importantly, able to ask questions of literature or of history undreamt of a generation ago. This is a revolution, ladies and gentlemen. It's a revolution in the way we think. Borges's narrator is so terrified by the implications of the infinite book of sand that he hides it in the one place he knows no one will ever find it, on the shelves of the National Library. This is a librarian's joke, but an outmoded one. Libraries are no longer closed spaces of this kind, preserving and concealing knowledge. They are open to the world. And I want to close with our own library, here in the center of the university, in the center of the city, in the center of the universe. The omphalos, to use a recurring image from the greatest of all works of Dublin, Ulysses. It's one of the world's great libraries, and certainly one of its most beautiful. 
It's the university's center of gravity. And now, with its strategy, it has its own version of one of the characteristic literary forms of modernity. It has a manifesto. All truly modern movements must have their manifesto. And the Trinity Library manifesto joins Marinetti's futurist manifesto, Wyndham Lewis's vorticist manifesto, Hugo Ball's Dadaist manifesto, Andre Breton's surrealist manifesto, not to mention Marx and Engels's communist manifesto, a work which, not to stretch a point, has its own links with Trinity, as its famous opening line, a spectre is haunting Europe, contains a conscious, deliberate allusion to the work of another of Trinity's great alumni, Edmund Burke. Out of the tomb of the murdered monarchy in France has arisen a vast, tremendous, unformed spectre. The Trinity Library Manifesto lists seven responsibilities. Moral, intellectual, cultural, social, statutory, financial, professional. The ordering is surely deliberate, and I cannot tell you how pleased I am that moral is the first responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in good hands. Thank you very much.